Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, welcome to our panel discussion, uh, virtual conversation, whatever we call them these days. Uh, our panel discussions is entitled Climate Resilience and Urgent Opportunity for U.S. Leadership. Uh, this is an official side event associated with President Biden. Oh, we want a committee. Mike, it seems like we may be losing you. Are others having a hard time hearing Mike? Yes. Yeah, Department of the Interior during the Obama administration, we'll be featuring uh, Deputy Secretaries today. Um, and um, also, uh, formerly Commissioner of the Bureau of Reclamation, a big water resources agency at the department. And so I'm a bit of a water geek. Uh, and then probably most important for this uh, event today is that I am on the advisory board for the Nicholas Institute, one of the uh, sponsors of the Resilience Roadmap Project. Um, most important, we have, as you see on the screen there, a terrific group of speakers, uh, panelists here today uh, for the conversation. We appreciate uh, particularly David Hayes and Cecilia Martinez uh, taking time from what's an incredibly busy week uh, to be with us here this morning. Um, uh, I'm looking, so I apologize if I'm having uh, uh, connection issues. Hopefully that's cleared up now. Uh, we've got hundreds of people registered for this event. It's, uh, it's terrific. Uh, and I think it just demonstrates the huge interest that exists in climate uh, resilience particularly as communities have an ongoing uh, issues and wrestle with the mounting impacts of climate change. And I think look to at this moment in time, uh, the administration for new leadership um, and action in this area. So thank you for submitting your questions along with your registration. Uh, we reviewed them and hopefully work them into the discussion with the panelists. Um, and so with that, uh, let me uh, move forward and introduce a little bit more in detail our panelists. I can't do them justice in the time allowed because we want to have uh, plenty of time to get into the discussion of the issues. Um, but let me welcome our speakers. Um, Cecilia Martinez, uh, as you see up on the screen, there are a picture of Cecilia. She's the Senior Director for Environmental Justice at the Council on Environmental Quality at the White House. Uh, before she joined the administration, Cecilia founded the Center for Earth, Energy and Democracy. And in 2020, very significantly, she was named one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in this country. Uh, and once again, taking personal prerogative here, uh, Cecilia is a fellow New Mexican. And to me, that's a, a very significant part of her background also. Um, our next panelist is David Hayes. David is uh, a special assistant to the president for climate policy. David was my predecessor at the Department of the Interior, served as Deputy Secretary, Chief Operating Officer of the Department. And I should say David served in that capacity in two administrations, the Clinton administration, as well as the Obama administration. And so we're very lucky with his wealth of experience. The administration is lucky to have him and we're lucky to have him as a panelist. Uh, Jamie Bavishi is uh, with us today. She's the Director of New York City Mayor's Office of Resiliency. Uh, and also has terrific experience at the federal level, uh, formerly serving as Associate Director for Climate Preparedness at the Council on Environmental Quality during the Obama administration. Uh, and then finally, um, we have Karen Diver. Karen is the former chairwoman of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa in Minnesota. Uh, she served as one of the two tribal leaders on President Obama, Obama's State, Local, and Tribal Leaders Task Force on Climate Resiliency and Adaptation, so has a wealth of experience in this area. Uh, and she later served uh, as President Obama's Special Assistant for Native American Affairs. So welcome to everybody, uh, and thanks again for your time and participation uh, today. Let me quickly move to an overview of the Resilience Roadmap, just so you let, so let you know um, who's bringing you this uh, discussion and what the goals uh, of the resilient roadmap uh, are. So in executive order uh, 14008, President Biden, this is the executive order issued on the 27th of January, President Biden set climate resilience as a critical whole of government priority. 
So much work is needed, obviously, to translate that ambition to action and impact and benefits to local communities. Uh, in, this experience, in this spirit, the Resilience Roadmap Project has convened leading resilience experts, many who formerly worked in the federal government uh, and uh, otherwise are on the front lines, front lines of the climate change battle in order to offer up practical and useful insights on how the federal government should step up on climate resilience. Uh, you see on the screen in front of you the steering committee of folks leading this effort. Um, we don't pretend to speak for the thousands of experts and practitioners out there who have been working long and hard on climate resilience. Uh, hundreds of you have registered for this event and we're uh, very happy to have your participation now as well as hopefully in the future. Uh, what the Resilience Roadmap is focused on is to be blunt, repairing the connectivity that needs to exist between the federal government um, and its work on climate resiliency and the vital work that hasn't taken any time out uh, at the uh, state, local, uh, tribal level uh, and the need to uh, once again uh, marry up those efforts with the new priority that's being done at the federal level. Um, and we know that many federal agencies have done their climate work in the background over the last several, uh, several years. So we see this as a unique moment, an opportunity for presidential leadership. And our goal is to help translate that into practical actions. Um, so uh, the project is hosted by the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions at Duke University uh, and Susan Bell and Associates. And today uh, we are releasing a first set of 10 recommendations. Um, so you see the recommendations slide there. Uh, I'm not going to go into each recommendation. Uh, the summary is there. I would encourage you. There's a uh, website that's there in the lower uh, bottom corner. Um, and so uh, I would just say, please go to the website, see the recommendations, the 10 page paper associated with it. Uh, I do want to point out though three important principles uh, that we've across all of these recommendations. Um, and the first is that climate resiliency must be central to a comprehensive climate change strategy. Uh, resilience building um, can deliver tangible on the ground benefits, create jobs, safeguard public health and safety, help steward our national resources, protect and revitalize our economy, uh, invest in long-term uh, restorative solutions, as well as just fundamentally reducing the risk to property. So resiliency goes hand in hand uh, with mitigation and needs to be central to the comprehensive climate effort. Second principle is that resilience building must uh, prioritize vulnerable com communities. And we know the administration is strongly committed to that. Those communities have been marginalized by structural targeting and historical divestment. And so the efforts associated with resilience should recognize that the impacts, stresses of climate change uh, act as a threat multiplier, uh, falling most heavily on these marginalized people and communities. Um, so that's the second principle that's inherent in these recommendations. Uh, last third principle is that resilience building requires a vertically integrated whole of government approach. Uh, and we've heard President Biden talk about that whole of government uh, approach uh, necessary across the federal agencies, uh, but also fostering alignment amongst state, local communities, tribal peoples, Regional, regional entities, community groups, uh, civil society, and the private sector. Uh, and that's a difficult task, but fundamentally critical to uh, making progress in this area. Um, so these recommendations are just the start of the work. Uh, the project plans to take a more in-depth look at the key questions and key agency actions that can provide more detailed um, action plans to address uh, this critical issue at this moment. Um, we have an email that I think is being put up in the chat uh, function. And so from that standpoint, uh, please provide your input. Uh, please uh, uh, please uh, uh, provide us any recommendation of experts that we should re reach out to. There's still a lot of work, uh, a lot of work to get done uh, here. So, that's uh, the Resilience the Roadmap Project. Uh, that's who we are. That's the purpose here. Uh, let's get to our discussion um, and the panelists that we have that can provide some thoughts on the efforts that are already underway. And from that standpoint, 
Uh, I want to start with uh, David Hayes. Uh, this is fun for me, as I told David earlier. Uh, I've worked for David off and on for a good part of the last two decades uh, and learned a lot from him. But uh, today I get to ask some questions. Um, and from that standpoint, we'll, we'll turn it around a little bit from our uh, history together. So from that, um, David, let me just note the obvious that President Biden has made uh, significant resilience commission uh, commitments, has started forward with a number of initiatives, proposed new spending in a very robust budget in this area, uh, and the American Jobs Plan in particular focuses on a lot of resilience strategies. Um, so I've got a little bit of a three-part question that you can take in any order that you'd like. Um, just in general, what should we expect from the federal government uh, moving forward? Uh, how does it measure up to the focus that has been initially uh, a priority from my perspective on mitigation and emissions reductions? And do you have any uh, just initial reaction to the recommendations provided by the resilience? Uh, roadmap at this point in time. Uh, so how much time we got, Mike? Uh, an hour? Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a great uh, set of questions. Um, let me just first say uh, how delighted I am to be here and thank you to the Duke uh, Nicholas School for putting out uh, this important resilience roadmap. Tim Perfetta does a wonderful job down there and I know Susan, my old friend Susan Bell, uh, my young friend, uh, but longtime friend Susan Bell is is deeply involved in this. I also want to thank Jeremy Simons, who uh, is another longtime friend who's helped put this thing together. Um, so this is really an important subject uh, per your uh, your uh, opening remarks uh, and important to the Biden administration. I'm here in the White House. The fact that that there is now a, a climate office in the White House headed up by uh, Gina McCarthy, uh, for which uh, I'm affiliated, uh, with which I'm affiliated, uh, and the fact that we truly are doing a whole of government effort across the, the entirety of the climate issue. Uh, uh, Gina is chairing the White House National Climate Task Force. Uh, our third meeting is tomorrow. Uh, it is populated by the entire cabinet, uh, and we talk about climate. Uh, and tomorrow, I will say, we're going to talk a bunch about resilience. Uh, so it's, it's front and center. Uh, in terms of what you can expect from the Biden administration, I think you can expect that the early statements about resilience will continue to get uh, fleshed out and actualized. Uh, you mentioned the executive order uh, confirmation of the importance of resilience. Uh, that, that second executive order, 14. 2008 uh, takes uh, both the traditional path on resilience, but also some new paths on resilience. Traditional paths, yes, you'll see that we're re-energizing the, the climate action plans for the agencies uh, that have frankly been, uh, 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 have, have, were stopped in the tracks for four years, basically. Uh, we're looking to deal with the reality that we need sustainable infrastructure. Uh, throughout the federal government and, and throughout the, uh, the federal funding structure. Uh, we, we are focusing on the need for the federal government to help lo local tribal state folks with better climate forecasting, with better information services, with mapping services, et cetera. And we're acknowledging in that, uh, the president's acknowledging in that executive order that, that this is not only a whole of government federal side, but I like your notion of the verticality of it, got to go down because this is inherently a place-based issue. So if you don't have the local folks, the state folks, the tribal folks involved, uh, this won't work. Um, so that's the kind of traditional stuff. Uh, but now you also see in that executive order, this 30 by 30 commitment to, to, to conserve 30% of the land mass in the oceans of the US. That's quintessentially a resilience focus with enormous, we think, consequences all for the good. Also, you've got a, a commitment to form a civilian a climate corps that will, uh, that, and resilience will be in its middle name. 
We don't need any more names. It's so hard to get out civilian climate core, uh, but let's put resilience in there uh, as well. And also the, the new wrinkle, and Cecilia is going to talk about this, is that with everything climate, we talk about equity as well. Uh, and, and we focus on the communities, particularly those communities uh, that are disadvantaged and that have borne the brunt of the climate crisis to date, both in terms of, of new insults, but also the traditional insults of pollution that's come from fossil fuels. Big attention on that. And as you mentioned, the jobs plan, it talks more about natural infrastructure, billions of dollars in this area, uh, lots more to talk about. Uh, and uh, rather than, than go on, I'll, I'll hope to come back to this. Let me just say, I think that while we are focusing tremendously on mitigation and emissions reductions as we have to, and that'll be the that'll probably be the top line this week uh, as 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 the president announces the the ND, the NDC. Um, but I think I think uh, resilience is is going to measure up, and I I think the resilience roadmap that you have helped put together will help show us the way. Great, thank. You. David, I think, uh, and I really appreciate you mentioning the new innovative approaches, such as the 30 by 30 initiative. I think 30 by 30 in particular is one of those areas that not only uh, advances the goals with respect to mitigation, but advances the goals with respect to resilience. It's a double bang for the buck. Uh, and I know the details are gonna be uh, incredibly important to implement that initiative, but I do think you know that has significance on both ends of the spectrum of the comprehensive approach to climate. Um, that's a great overview. Appreciate your thoughts. I'm going to move now. Uh, we're going to include everybody in the conversation here and get back to certainly David, uh, but I'm going to move to Cecilia real quick, who's on the phone with us today, and really appreciate again, uh, Cecilia, you joining us. Um, so congratulations on uh, launching the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Uh, that's um, a much needed um, you know, set of perspectives that need to be part of this process. Uh, also, congratulations to you and everybody else at CEQ. We're all excited to know that Brenda Mallory was confirmed as CEQ, CEQ chair last week. Uh, any confirmation, uh, David knows, I know is pretty significant. Uh, and so I think it just, speaks well that Brenda was confirmed so quickly. Uh, she contributed to the Climate 21 project, which Duke also convened and is really a predecessor and model uh, to what we're trying to do with respect to the resilience roadmap. Um, so Cecilia, where do you see, given your work on environmental justice and the priority that you've uh, historically had and now have as responsibility in your present position, where do you see the intersections between your work and the opportunities to build greater resiliency for frontline communities and others who stand in the path of climate change's mounting toll. And as David said, the insults uh, that have been the result of, of climate change and its impacts. Uh, we've got lots of people working at state, tribal, and local levels. And I think everybody's wondering uh, how to access the resources and work with the federal government as the strategy unfolds. So Cecilia, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, like David, let me just say it's a real pleasure and honor to be here with you all. I apologize that I can't be on video, um, but I am looking forward to um, to working with many of you. Um, let me just say um, from my perspective and coming into CEQ and to the level of work that this administration is doing on climate, um, that equally important and equally bold and innovative um, as the climate agenda is, is the environmental justice agenda. You mentioned the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Uh, the first time in the history of the United States that environmental justice community members, community members that represent the most vulnerable communities, um, racially diverse communities, income diverse communities, the very first time that a FACA um, a federal um, advisory council of this nature has been situated at the level that it is. And I can say that the environmental justice community um, sees this as a momentous occasion. 
um, sees the WEJAC, um, the acronym we have for it, um, as a critically important tool uh, for communities to be able to offer their thoughts, uh, their recommendations, their uh, ideas about what we need to do with the federal government, um, but also to enlighten um, the situation that they are in. Um, you know, one of the critical pieces that we've seen throughout history is that um, oftentimes the intersection of these very important environmental issues um, have not done well in terms of understanding the realities of our most vulnerable communities. And the environmental justice movement began um, as a movement to try and provide those intersections. Um, its mantra is that we all need to live in a healthy environment where we live, work, play, pray, and learn. Um, and if there's anything that I don't know of anything that's more intersectional than that, um, that that idea that communities need to be whole, um, they need to be healthy, um, they need to be um, at a level where the pollution isn't harming um, their families, and they need to work in places that are safe. Um, so climate resilience in many ways um, is just the next level of the work of environmental justice to build resiliency in communities um, previously. Um, you know, the idea that we have resiliency in many different forms, I think, is a critical point um, that we need to address. So, for example, a community has a physical infrastructure. Obviously, there are resiliency needs in building an infrastructure that is redundant, but also can withstand the types of climate impacts that we have. For communities that have been historically been disinvested in, um, it is of utmost um, importance that we target and prioritize, prioritize um, investments to bring those communities up to par with other communities with respect to resilience. Um, there's also resilience in the ecosystem, um, natural um, resilience that we know that we need to pay attention to. Um, and this is an important environmental justice issue because of indigenous populations. Um, the reliance both on subsistence, um, but also very deep cultural significance of the natural environment. And so resilience becomes an environmental justice issue of the natural ecosystem for many of our communities as well. And of course, there's the social um, community resilience. How do we build up social networks? How do we build up the capacity of communities to continue to develop their social networks in ways that can sustain and support when uh, severe events happen? And I think it's been um, a testament um, to this administration that like the whole of government climate change approach, there is also a whole of government environmental justice approach. So we are working as well uh, with the White House Climate Office, making sure that environmental justice and equity is a critical component throughout the agenda and also working across agencies with the interagency working group on coal communities. Um, the strategies um, are just being developed, um, but they're being developed in a way that is paying critical attention to the most vulnerable communities. So it, it really is an exciting time. I think it's an exciting time where, where we're being bold and innovative and can serve as a model both um, in this country, but also um, internationally as well as how you, how you integrate equity into the climate resilience uh, world. Those are great thoughts, uh, Cecilia, and we appreciate uh, you putting them on the table. Uh, I now uh, have a new acronym, WEJAC, um, which uh, <laughs> doesn't roll off the tongue, but uh, will hopefully be integrated into uh, the rest of the federal alphabet suit, because I think it's really important for what you mentioned there, the whole of government approach that will exist with respect to environmental justice it's gonna to have to start with education uh, and uh, the advisory council providing that input and helping the range of agencies understand uh, the issues that need to be addressed at the local level as to advance environmental justice and the historical inequities, uh, obviously. So uh, I appreciate that's a precursor to building more capacity within those communities uh, and working hand in hand with federal agencies. So very much appreciate your thoughts. Uh, on that and having you know put 
vulnerable communities on the table. I think uh, it's appropriate to turn now to Karen uh, Diver real quickly and bring you into this, the discussion, Karen, particularly given your expertise on tribal nations um, and understanding the unique relationship that tribal nations have with the uh, federal government, um, their sovereign uh, status, uh, and the uniqueness that that brings that has to be a taken account in the resilience agenda. So just generally, um, given your background experience, what is the best, best path forward to include tribes in the development of resiliency plans? What do they need uh, with respect to uh, their work with the federal trustee, the federal government and agencies in this area? Thank you. Thank you very much for highlighting the fact that um, indigenous peoples, tribes have a unique political status as well as um, racial and cultural status um, that changes things a little bit when we look at what environmental justice and um, resiliency looks like for indigenous communities. Um, it was noted earlier by David Hayes that people are place-based and tribes no more so. We have treaty-defined areas that really aren't subject to renegotiation. Um, you know, as climate impacts are felt, they aren't going to move reservations or ceded territories. And so much of our culture and um, our identity is tied to the terrestrial landscape. Unfortunately, that treaty and trust responsibility doesn't really translate well to landscape scale planning. Um, there's no incentive for states and um, municipalities to include tribes on landscape scale resiliency planning. So anything the federal government can do to make sure that states are including tribal equities um, and, and tribal planners and tribal government in those landscape scale plans are incredibly important. Tribes have been traditionally under-resourced for normal government functions, whether it's housing, roads, schools, et cetera, um, just to meet current day demands. They certainly aren't resourced enough to look at resiliency efforts. And so when we are increasingly seeing um, different climate-related events, um, our infrastructure just takes a battering. Um, our facilities take a battering. Our people take a battering. We're less able to respond to those crises. The Biden administration has been great um, in responding to the pandemic of realizing those inequities and providing extra resources. And certainly with the climate crisis, this would be an opportunity to say, where can we ramp up tribes, their capacity um, and their planning efforts um, Nearly all of them have shovel ready projects um, that could be implemented, whether it's around natural resources, water capacity, alternative energy, um, et cetera. A real important thing is data, making sure that tribes have access to data for planning, have, have the staff capacity, have their federal, federal partners propping them up and assisting them in creating their resiliency plans um, that are complementary to the jurisdictions around them. Um, and then I'm also gonna caution a little bit, tribes are excited about 30 by 30, um, but we're also a little concerned about um, additional habitat being taken off for traditional um, off the plate for access to traditional life ways, um, whether that's hunting, fishing, or gathering. Um, you know, the national parks creation is a national jewel, but it was at the de detriment of indigenous peoples. And we'll have to make sure that um, those equities aren't impacted by additional conservation efforts. We could be considering um, tribal traditional use areas, co-management opportunities, um, so that we're preserving um, traditional life ways and spiritualities for our indigenous peoples. I actually, along those lines, have a question for Cecilia. Um, you know, given the unique political status of, of tribes, and their disproportionate impact around environmental justice issues. Um, you know, have there been any discussions um, yet or plans developed in terms of tribal engagement and how we make sure we respect that political status and cultural status of tribal people when we look at environmental justice issues and climate planning? Thank you so much, Karen. And can I just say, even though I'm a New Mexican, um, I've lived in Minnesota for the last 20 years. So um, have many good friends at Fond du Lac. Um, 
and other places uh, in Minnesota. Your question is is at the heart of of I think what we what we need to be doing. Um, as you know, um, uh, and I don't need to, <laughs> I don't need to repeat this. Um, you've you've said it so eloquently that. Um, that the United States has a nation to nation uh, relationship with tribal governments. Um, that has that has not always been the best um, process and the best respect for treaty rights and that nation to nation um, relationship. And I think um, one of the key things that I am seeing in the Biden administration that at all levels and in all agencies, at least the ones that I've been in discussion with, um, there is very serious attention taken to how do we do tribal consultation? Um, so at the White House, you know, uh, the place where you were form formerly at, um, very clear and open in making sure that um, the tribal consultation happens. I know um, for us at CEQ um, in NEPA, it's a critically important piece. Um, and not only was there um, extensive consultation with um, tribal government leaders um, during the campaign and during the transition, that is all continuing um, to ensure that what issues are on the table, both in terms of, uh, as you mentioned, shovel-ready projects, but also um, what are some concerns um, that might be forthcoming with different initiatives. Um, at the agency level, I know that there are there is um, serious attention being paid and serious tribal outreach um, by Department of Energy, Department of Transportation um, on their own to continue to build out um, their agenda and particularly around Justice 40, because I think Justice 40, as we all know, is that 40 percent investment benefit in clean energy, clean transportation. Uh, legacy pollution, workforce training, um, and a critical component of that is trying to figure out where are um, some of the barriers, historical barriers, to getting those monies to the most vulnerable communities, including tribal communities. What, Where have been um, the hurdles and where and how can we shift and make sure to address those hurdles in a way that actually get meaningfully to those to those communities in a way that they um, have identified their needs. Um, so I think um, in answer to your question, I think that this is fundamentally as part of both the environmental justice agenda, but more broadly, the nation to nation respectful relationship with with tribal governments, that that outreach and that engagement is continuing to be a high priority across the agencies and with CEQ as well. Thank you so much. Yes, thanks a lot, Cecilia. I mean, I think uh, the conversation to this moment, as well as your your comments, just focus on that whole of government approach and integrating uh, the different relationships, the different activities of the federal government, and putting bringing that together, and then integrating environmental justice, communication, education as part of that process. And it's a challenge, but it's uh, it's incredibly important to make progress. So thank you for your thoughts. I want to bring Janie into the conversation now, and particularly given her experience at the local level, and I know she's got great uh, national chops uh, too, but in our uh, discussions about the resilience roadmap, it's been pretty significant to me, the work uh, that Janie has been leading as far in New York City. Uh, and we know that the action over the last four years and prior to that even haven't paused at all with respect to climate and resiliency, uh, particularly in New York City. Um, and I think we talked a little bit about vertical in integration as being a fundamental principle. Um, it'd be good to know what have you done and what's been uh, some of the leading actions that uh, you'd like to talk about with respect to New York City. And what do you need now, having worked in this area, led these projects, uh, not having a great partner at the federal level, but now having the opportunity to have that change. What do you need from the federal government as a partner in meeting this resilience imperative? Thanks so much, Mike, and thanks, David and Cecilia, for, for joining us for this important conversation. So um, New York City, uh, over the last four years, has not been waiting for Washington. We've been moving ahead urgently um, in advancing our climate resilience and adaptation portfolio. 
Um, we face a range of impacts. We're preparing for um, uh, coastal storms like Hurricane Sandy, sea level rise, extreme heat and intense pre precipitation and implementing a multi-layered strategy to prepare for that range of hazards. We've got 520 miles of coastline. So we are um, strengthening our, our coastal resiliency while upgrading our buildings. We have a 1 million buildings in New York City. So we're um, trying to build the most resilient building code in the world and, and upgrading the, the buildings that um, we have now through resilient retrofits. Um, we are also strengthening um, and hardening our infrastructure, including um, energy, water, sewer, wastewater, um, transportation, and telecommunications so that we can minimize disruptions to critical services during and after an extreme event. Um, and then we're also working to ensure that residents and businesses have the information they need to make informed decisions in the face of climate impacts. And all of this work is grounded by the best available science. We're very lucky in New York City to be working with an independent panel of scientists, the New York City Panel on Climate Change, that provides us with local projections every three years so that we can um, really use that information as the basis of our entire resiliency portfolio. Um, this work is, is um, uh, funded by a, a $20 billion um, uh, allocation, 15 billion of which came from uh, post-Sandy federal recovery dollars. Um, and so I think that, you know, the thing that we're hoping um, we can uh, partner with, with DC on going forward and with the Biden administration in particular is more money so that we can take proactive action to um, address these challenges. Um, and with that, you know, I think there's some, there's some promising trajectory for programs like BRIC, Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities. Um, we're excited about, um, you know, just the, the focus on pre-disaster mitigation. Um, but we need the, those programs to be flexible enough to, range the, to address the range of hazards that we face um, and to make sure that we can allocate those dollars to the most vulnerable communities um, and, and, and the those who are most impacted. Um, I'll say one more thing about something we're doing in New York City because I think it's relevant, um, which is that we actually just passed a local mandate to take all of our climate hazards and projections into account in our entire $90 billion capital portfolio. Um, this is really big because it will stop, uh, it will shift the paradigm from thinking about climate resiliency projects as, as being in its own silo, as being in their own silo, and really start embedding a climate resilience perspective across everything that we're doing. Um, so we're excited about that as well and, and you know, hope that you know, we, we can continue conversations with the Biden administration on how to take that model and apply it at the federal level. Um, but building off of that, I'd love to ask a question of David. You know, David, you mentioned, we've been talking about the whole of government approach throughout this whole conversation, and you mentioned the 30 by 30 commitment and the, the, um, the conservation core, which are really exciting developments. Um, you know, I'd love to hear more on how you see um, those nature-based solutions being integrated with solutions, resilient solutions for the built-in environment and for communities, which are so important for urban environments like New York City. Um, we're certainly um, pairing our nature-based work with, with infrastructure buildings and, and community-based work. And that's gonna require a whole of government approach across the federal government so that environmental agencies like NOAA and DOI and, and, um, uh, and, and others can uh, partner with um, you know, the housing and, and, and uh, disaster management agencies like FEMA and HUD. Um, what do you see as the barriers and opportunities? Hey, David, before you jump into that question, I just wanna note, I think Cecilia has got uh, a, a, an issue she's got to deal with and is going to jump off. And I just wanted to interject real quickly and say, thank you very much, Cecilia. We recognize you need to go. Uh, appreciate your input. And of course, thank you for all you're doing uh, within the administration to advance these issues that are incredibly important and a priority. Um, so sorry, David, for the brief interruption. No problem. And Thanks. Uh, I'll share my thanks to Cecilia as well and wish her good luck uh, and, um, and welcome her back uh, to the White House when she can come. Um, so uh, Jenny raises a really important question and I note that the Resilience Roadmap Project takes us on to some extent, uh, which is really how can, uh, how can we be sure that nature-based solutions uh, like natural infrastructure when it comes to coastal resilience, for example, get a fair shake uh, when it comes to uh, consideration of strategies to deal with uh, storm surge, uh, uh, rising sea levels, et cetera. 
Um, and uh, this is going to require, I think, employing some of the suggestions made in the roadmap to rethink uh, some of the traditional tools that are used when the federal government is deciding how to uh, spend its money, often through states uh, in this area, uh, and looking at the quote unquote cost benefit uh, benefits of various projects, uh, where the traditional uh, calculus doesn't really take into account the, the long term benefits and the ecosystem benefits that may attend to, for example, a, uh, a nature based resilience approach as opposed to uh, a, a gray uh, infrastructure approach. Um, and, and this is going to take some work. Um, we've convened already uh, several of the agencies to talk about coastal resilience strategies. And on the one hand, are very excited about the possibilities because uh, we have a, a, an excellent potential flow of money now uh, in, in, in the coastal resilience area through, as, as, uh, as Janie mentioned, the BRIC program, for example, which now, and this is, this is essentially brand new, up to 6% of all of the monies that are identified for FEMA for disaster response should be set aside for pre-disaster mitigation, which is an enormous amount of money uh, and, uh, and available to, to help shore up and anticipate these uh, disasters that we know are going to come. So how do we essentially work with local, state, and tribal partners to ensure those funds are spent in, the, in, in, in a way that, that makes sense and that avoids kind of the bureaucratic default uh, that we're going to do what, what this, what's always been done in this locality before. It's going to take leadership on, on both sides, on the, on the federal government side and on the, the the local and state and tribal side as well. There's, there's also, of course, um, huge dollars that HUD has still, uh, really growing out of that Hurricane Sandy experience that Janie uh, mentioned before, and that, that I was the, the Deputy Secretary of Interior when that happened, and saw how, uh, how the federal government could move uh, in tandem with jurisdictions like New York effectively, and where, in fact, $400, 400 million dollars was effectively spent by the Interior Department in doing some resilience analysis uh, that uh, that that uh, uh, that confirms the benefits uh, of the, the the refuges in New Jersey and the the other uh, natural barriers that helped uh, blunt the effects of, of Hurricane uh, Sandy. So, uh, good question, and uh, and happy to to share share some thoughts there. Let me, I want to open it up to, to all the panelists now to talk a little bit about, and I want to double down on this uh, discussion that David, you just ended up on, because it's getting a lot of, uh, uh, it's resonating with folks in the chat, and it's the idea of an ounce of pre prevention. And I think we've you know, had those discussions since the Obama administration about pre-disaster, Janie mentioned about that, uh, mitigation activities, uh, designing differently. Um, but I don't know that even in an intellectual or academic discussion about the importance of that and how you can save money that it's really, you know, become integrated in our budgeting processes. Uh, and I don't know that it's really, you know, resonated completely in Congress. And this gets to, you know, disaster relief is important, but um, in, when you're in the middle of a drought, it's hard to address that through drought relief programs as opposed to the conservation, to the efficiency work, to the uh, ability to move water from communities that don't have it to communities that do have it. So that's a long-winded windup to just ask the question for everybody. Um, do you think we're making that transition now? We're at the start of it where we're really evaluating pre-disaster activity, learning from the disasters that we've had, the Hurricane Sandy situation, uh, and will it really take hold uh, as advocated by this administration in making the types of investments that save us money long-term and to protect communities, particularly vulnerable communities? 
Well, I'll, I'll jump in just to start, but I'll, I'll really value Janie and Karen's uh, input here. Uh, I think we're at the start of this. Um, the, the, the prior administration uh, did not um, put much attention on these issues. Um, uh, we do have some new tools. We have a new commitment to acknowledge the uh, seriousness of the impacts that climate is having on, our, on every aspect uh, of our society uh, and the importance of, of, uh, of, of being smart about how we spend our, our, again, really potentially pretty ample resources. Uh, I think uh, I think this is a, a, a real challenge to our, our, an opportunity for our federalism system, because this is an area where, as you know, Mike, the federal government is, uh, has, has some dollars now, some major dollars, and it has some tools that should facilitate how, those, how local decisions about how those dollars are spent are are, are take advantage of the learnings that, that have developed in other areas. And, and this is the challenge because, you know, um, a county commissioner in South Carolina uh, doesn't necessarily know what, what worked in the Gulf where, you know, literally $10 billion has been spent on coastal resilience activities uh, uh, after the BP oil spill. What have we learned from those projects? There's not a good information source, clearinghouse source, uh, 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 exchange of information. Uh, that, and, and so I think you're getting a lot of reinventing the wheel. Uh, Janie can confirm that, that I think a lot of localities uh, and states have, have sort of stitched together relationships and, and, uh, and share, shared experiences and all that, which, is, which has been tremendous. And I've been, uh, I, I've been involved in some of those discussions, uh, but, but surely the federal government uh, can do much more in terms of facilitating the knowledge transfer and then also in, in, in busting these bureaucratic uh, uh, knee-jerk reactions that, 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 that lie in, uh, that, prevent, that provide barriers to being smart about how we spend that money. So it's an exciting time. And let me also say that uh, we're excited in the federal government. We're soon going to have a resilience lead uh, here in the White House. Uh, uh, and, and I know everyone's uh, waiting for that. No one more than me, I should say. Uh, so uh, we're going to have a center of gravity uh, in the White House complex that will be uh, quarterbacking this resilience effort. Uh, and it's it's uh, it's going to get a lot of attention, and uh, it is it, it, it's I, I I wish we could say uh, we're uh, you know we've had uh, we're on the 50 yard line heading toward the goal line or even down into the uh, red zone. Uh, we're not. Uh, we we we've just taken possession of the ball, uh, and we've got a long way to go. Well, I want to let Janie and Karen uh, jump in on this uh, ounce of prevention idea, but I do did have to note that, uh, David, we appreciate the bone uh, on the recommendations list from the Resilience Roadmap, uh, Resilience Lead was number one, so very much appreciate uh, that. Great minds. Uh, we'll take it from there. Uh, Janie and Karen? Um, I'm happy to jump in here. Um, you know, I, I think David, your point about knowledge transfer is really important. Um, I will say though that um, I find that the you know strategies we're using to build resilience and adapt New York City's coastal communities are as diverse as the hundred coastal communities we have. So a lot of this work is quite place-based, as we've said before, but place-based really to the the neighborhood or community level. So recognizing that, you know, I, I think that it's important to to make sure we're not reinventing the wheel, but I also think that the federal government just has an incredibly important role to play um, in creating the enabling environment, very broadly speaking, right? Creating incentives um, and really embedding resilience as a criteria for all federal funding, um, but, but, but also providing the tools and resources that localities, states, tribes, territories need to then, um, uh, rise to that, right? Rise to that that mandate. Um, meaning, uh, 
uh, dollars for, for pre-development um, so that we're not just um, favoring shovel-ready projects, um, the technical assistance that's needed, the data and information. So I think you know, there's sort of a, a constellation of resources that the federal government can provide to really build the capacity and provide the resources. Um, and and I, I, I think you're right that we're, we're, there are some sort of, there's some opportunities on the horizon, especially um, as I said before, the BRIC program is a great example of that. But I, I really hope that um, you know, the Biden administration will, um, will move in this direction of a whole of government approach in terms of creating the whole of government, uh, in terms of creating that enabling environment, um, because I think that will create a much stronger mandate um, and, and really uh, support the, um, uh, the, the environment in which we can uh, do this work urgently together. For my part, I really worry about um... For tribal governments, they're they're separate but sometimes unequal. Um, they get their own streams of funding um, that come directly to them. Um, often don't have the ability to cost share. Often can't use, for example, uh, money that's coming from FEMA. You need matching dollars. You can't use BIA road money, for example, or HUD money. Um, to meet that match, so that that problem of commingling and certainly in this area of building resilience and mitigation, um, tribes need to have the ability to put those funding packages together. The whole of government approach to me really says that if you are talking to states about their planning efforts, that you absolutely have to ask them how they've included and are coordinating with their tribal communities. There is no other incentive for them to do that. It's fairly hit and miss amongst the 50 states, the level of inclusion of tribes. Um, but if that's a question the federal government asks and an expectation, um, that will be a game changer in terms of that, like I said, that landscape scale planning. That's that's a great perspective, uh, Karen, on there's always been a separation between tribes and state and local communities, less so these days because tribes have gained some uh, political power in certain areas. And so that causes states and local entities to deal with them. Uh, but integrating the need from a federal perspective to have that connection there, even as the federal government fulfills its trust responsibilities to tribes or tries to uh, and builds capacity is incredibly important. Um, so appreciate the, putting those thoughts on the table. Uh, and JD and David, I love the, what I think you all were getting at the concept of an enabling environment. And it's never viewed as, as the most bold and robust work that the federal government does, but in providing information and best practices and data uh, to everybody is just such an incredibly important and valuable uh, function that the federal government plays. Um, and it's, you know, it's a launch pad to a whole lot of good things that can, can happen uh, in the aftermath of that. Um, so it's good to, you know, the basics are not always the viewed as the most bold, but they're so important and data and informa information sharing make up those basics. Um, I want to turn, I think we've got time for one quick question amongst the panelists. Um, and then I'm going to turn it to David for one final uh, question and thoughts uh, before we wrap up here in about six minutes. Um, just wanted to, to get your sense on uh, an issue of the day with respect to the electricity grid. Uh, I think the recent extreme weather events in Texas and the Plains areas demonstrated how fragile our grid is. Uh, and um, the need to, to work in this area. And it's also gonna be incredibly important to advancing the clean energy agenda overall. Um, and this gets into that whole of government and integration approach. How can the administration ensure that state regulator, regulators and utilities um, and consumers uh, you know, are in the mix, prioritize resilience and uh, enable decentralized distributed energy systems uh, exist such as microgrids that help build resiliency in the systems. You know, what can we do from the federal level, you know, all the way to a locality like New York, which has plenty of resources to tribal communities. Uh, maybe where maybe you can start where there isn't that access to electricity and start building in those microgrids, but anything thoughts on resiliency, particularly as it relates to electricity and the grid overall. 
Sure, I can kick off on that. Uh, obviously, that's been a big focus here uh, for the administration with the Texas situation and uh, uh, and the the jobs plan that the president uh, advanced uh, uh, includes some significant funding for uh, grid resilience through the Department of Energy. This is an area where, uh, just like the uh, disaster response, we, where federalism is, is a big player, as you say, uh, the local utilities and the public utilities commissions and states uh, really have uh, very key responsibilities here uh, with the assistance of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, and I think the Texas situation was a wake up call uh, that uh, the climate impacts uh, uh, can affect, you know, a backbone of, uh, of, of our economy, uh, electric transmission. And, and guess what? In order to com combat uh, climate, we're going to need more transmission. Uh, we're going to need to be able to, to uh, reach into the areas of the country, the Great Plains and others, where many of our uh, terrific renewable uh, energy resources are, and we need to tie our grid together. That's another lesson from, uh, uh, from uh, the Texas situation. So there's just no, uh, no escaping the fact that we have to deal with, uh, with uh, the, the need for resilience in, our, in, our, in this aspect of our, our, of our infrastructure. Let me just say that, uh, it, to some extent, I think it, in an odd kind of way, it's a helpful thing for us as a society to see how fragile uh, some of our uh, fundamental uh, uh, needs are because of climate change impacts. And, and one of the topics we're going to talk about in tomorrow's White House uh, Climate Task Force is the drought that is gripping the West right now. Uh, and and we're, we're going to ask Secretaries Vilsack and Holland to uh, kick the tires on the drought task force that you were involved in, Mike, uh, but that has really not gotten much attention in the last four years. And they're going to do a reset and, and, uh, and, and adopt, again, a whole of government response uh, to the drought crisis, both, uh, both the immediate crisis in the Klamath Basin and the, the others that are, are sure to come. So... Uh, I think uh, this is an excellent question because it reminds us that we're, we're not just talking about planning, we're talking about uh, response as well. It's, it, and it's all one big ball of wax that challenges us every day. Yes, the ground is, is moving beneath us even as we try and build resiliency. So I appreciate those thoughts. Okay, I'm going to feel like an <clears throat> NPR host. Uh, 20 seconds or less, Janie and Karen, any thoughts on the grid? And then a uh, final wrap up to David, just any thoughts, suggestions for everybody who's viewing this uh, panel discussion on how they might assist the administration. So uh, Janie, then Karen. I'll just say two quick things about the grid. Um, one, this really speaks to what I was talking about before, um, making sure that we're designing and building with climate change in mind across every investment we make. Um, uh, so that's why I'm so proud of the, the mandate that we've passed in New York City to make sure that we're accounting for climate change across our entire capital portfolio. Um, it doesn't matter what it is, we need to build it with climate change in mind. Um, the other thing I'll say is that, you know, we've been working with our local utility Con Edison to create a climate adaptation plan just to prepare for the, the kind of situation we saw in Texas play out um, in a local context. And we've also, um, you know, petitioned our public service commission at the state level to require the same of every utility in the state. Um, I hope that that's a direction we can go in nationally. That's great. Karen. I will say that the issues facing tribal communities are very much similar to what's facing a lot of rural America. Um, you have rural electric cooperatives, um, expensive disproportionate share of income where you already have um, economic insecurity. Um, so the whole of government approach is really about how do you make those sustainable and affordable for local units of government um, and enable um, rural government and tribal governments to form utilities, um, augment um, the sources um, with renewables, etc. And then just once again, um, help us protect our home homelands and life ways. Thank you. Great thoughts, Karen. David? Last uh, last words are yours. Any uh, thoughts on just recommendations for folks to help out uh, the administration moving forward? Uh, 
please uh, reach out to our new resilience lead uh, who will be identified soon. Uh, please um, uh, uh, reinforce uh, as, uh, in your own communities what we're trying to do, what the Biden administration is trying to do, which is bring equity and justice into this whole system. The emphasis, uh, a, a key emphasis today has been on the fact that not all communities are in the same situation when it comes to their vulnerability to climate impacts. And we, we need to prioritize our attention on those communities that are most at risk. Uh, tribal communities, disadvantaged communities, other communities of all kinds are, uh, 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 have different risk profiles and we need to be attentive to that. I look forward to everyone's help on this. This is a vertical whole of government effort. It's got to be up and down the, the, the federalism chain. Uh, and, and many of the solutions, as, as Janie correctly said, are very much have to be locally based and, uh, and, and fit the community. Help tell us how we can do better to achieve those good local results. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thanks for the leadership and the hard work. Uh, and thanks for everybody uh, to, for joining us today. Uh, as I mentioned, there was an email in the chat or you can go to the website. Uh, we'd love your input and thoughts and ideas of how to advance those recommendations with detailed action plans. Um, this is, as David just mentioned, and there's the, the uh, email address that's up now in the chat function. So, um, it's going to take all of us to make progress in the way that we need to. Thank you for your input and your time, and thanks for joining us. Um, and go to the website for any follow-up information. Appreciate everybody's time and interest. Take care.